Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finette, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub, school and consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today, I'll be speaking with Emily Wapnick. Emily is a writer, career coach, blogger, and community leader. She is the founder and creative director at PuttyLike.com, where she helps multi-potentialites, that's people with many passions and creative pursuits, integrate all of their interests to create dynamic, fulfilling, and fruitful careers and lives. Unable to settle on one path herself, Emily studied music, art, film production, and law, graduating from the law faculty at McGill University. Emily's TED Talk has been viewed over 3.7 million times and has been translated into 36 languages. She's been featured in Fast Company, Forbes, Financial Times, The Huffington Post, The BBC, and Lifehacker. Her book, How to Be Everything, a guide for those who still don't know what they want to be when they grow up, comes out next month in May 2017. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring to you the one, the only, Emily Wapnick. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the program <laughs> and you're joining us um, from British Columbia in Canada. I am, yeah. Yeah, and I understand you made the move back in December, so you're, I guess, new to that part of the world. How's it treating you? Uh, it's great. It's beautiful here. Um, I'm living on an island, so oh. I've been hiking every day and going to the beach and uh-huh. just really digging the kind of rural lifestyle, I guess. Yeah. And just being in nature. Wow, living on an island. Wow, life really sounds tough for, for Emily. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a good balance because right now I'm doing all of this book marketing and uh-huh. just there's like a lot of a lot of work and I'm online a lot, so it's mm-hmm. it's a really nice balance I feel like it keeps me sane a little bit yeah and, and I guess that's a beauty of um, living in 2017 where you release a book mm-hmm. and you don't necessarily need to go on a physical book tour you can um, embark on a virtual book tour from the comfort of an island that's true yeah um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably do a few stops but um, yeah publishers don't really do book tours very often anymore anyway so. yeah yeah well why why spend your time visiting you know libraries and universities and speaking in front of 50 to 100 people when you can get on a podcast and get in front of a hundred thousand right. right so right. it makes a lot of sense um <laughs> cool so usually when i um, research people i um try to find out a little bit about their interests so i can build some rapport but i know you have and have had many interests, which um, mm-hmm. I guess prompted um, your, your TED Talk, which we'll talk about in a little little while. But, um, you know, you've been a musician in a punk band called Frustrated Telephone <laughs> Operator. Uh, we, we can talk about that in a sec. Um, songwriter, web designer, filmmaker, writer, law student, coach, author, blogger, developer of TV pilot, all sorts of stuff. So I'm not even going to say, hey, let's, I'm not even going to try and hone in on one of those interests. So it sounds like you've had a lot and it totally resonates um, with me and I think a lot of our audience um, who are predominantly entrepreneurs. I mean, I played in a metal band many moons ago, <laughs> nightclub promoter, trained in mixed martial arts, worked in the big consulting firm, started a web startup and now run a consultancy and podcast and write books and all that sort of stuff. So I totally get where you're coming from. And based on what I know about you, you're saying that this is definitely something that people should embrace. I think that if it's, 
who you are and it's how you like to move through the world, then yeah, I mean, I don't think that everyone does this and I don't think everyone needs to, but um, there's this, there's this pressure in our culture to kind of specialize and to pick one thing and to deny all of your other interests and passions and curiosities and uh, to really, you know, just kind of fit yourself into a box. And I don't think you need to do that. I think um, life is more interesting when you embrace your various interests and you kind of see where things take you. And I also think that you end up doing more interesting work and potentially helping more people um, than if you try and kind of just stick with one thing, you know, Mm. assuming that's like, that's how you're wired. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know, from listening to your TED talk, um, you talk about how when you do chop and change, um, your energy levels and your excitement just ramps up and you get into that stage where I suppose your level of learning, I mean, it's basically rapid learning and Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs will know this well. They'll get super excited about an idea. They'll spend weeks and months um, building prototypes and finding out everything they can possibly know about a particular industry. And if they're lucky enough to find product market fit and get it to a point where it's just business as usual, then that interest tapers off and they need to go and find something else. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that's that's common. And I think there's a huge overlap between kind of the multi-potential aid community and the entrepreneur community. I think it's, it's a good fit for mm. people who have a lot of different interests. Um, also because when you're starting a business, um, especially at the beginning, you end up having to wear a lot of different hats and there are so many different elements to building a business. Yeah, definitely. And this is, um, ties into, well, let's, let's just touch on the book and I was going to talk about Mm -hmm. the strengths that the book talks about. So your first, first book, right? Yeah. Yeah. First book, how to be everything, a guide for those who still don't know what they want to be when they grow up. It's, um, available for pre-order at places where all good bookstores, where all good books are sold. And that comes out on May the 2nd next month. And the book talks about uh, three strengths of being what you call a multi-potentialite, um, being idea synthesis, rapid learning, and adaptability. And we're just talking about entrepreneurs and how to be a good entrepreneur. You really need to wear a lot of hats, but also connect the dots between lots of different um, experiences and observations and technologies to come up with new solutions. So maybe let's um, let's talk about idea synthesis. Sure. Uh, idea synthesis is when you take knowledge from one area and you use it to solve a problem in an unrelated field, and you kind of come up with something new at the intersection between these these two things that don't normally go together. Um, so there, there are a lot of examples of this if you look at inventions. Um, inventions often come from outsiders who kind of look at things a little bit differently and bring a different perspective. Um, one small example that I like yep. is um, Steve Jobs. He talks about this in his Stanford commencement speech mm-hmm. where he, he mentions, sorry, my dog is barking. That's cool. <laughs> um, he talks about how he sat in on a calligraphy class when he, after he had dropped out of college, he just, mm-hmm. you know, he snuck into the class and how that calligraphy class, just that one class became the inspiration for the typeface of the, yeah. like the beautiful typeface of the Apple computer. Right. So there's an example of kind of taking an outside interest and smushing it in with whatever you're working on to make that thing better. Yeah, and that's actually uh, one of my favorite stories on connecting the dots. I, I think I've told mm-hmm. it on the podcast before, and um, I think he says stuff about how Zen Buddhism also he tried to incorporate the minimalism into the Macintosh yeah. as well. And um, if it wasn't for him just going out to, I think it was Xerox um, Palo Alto Research Center, he never would have stumbled upon their first incarnation of the graphical user <laughs> interface, and you know, quote unquote, <laughs> stolen it for for Apple. So. But if he didn't put right. himself in all these different situations, he would have never had those insights. Right, exactly. And so multi-potentialize, and maybe I should define that term at some point too, yeah. but um, multi-potentialize because we have so many interests and we've explored so many things, we're able to make those connections and we're kind of able to be like, oh, wait, like I, I you know, this might be useful in this new context and, you know, mm. come up with that, that new idea. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And, and, and I suppose if... We don't put ourselves in different situations, don't speak to different people, um, research different types of technologies, et cetera, et cetera. We end up having a very narrow view of the world. And within that narrow view, there's only so many ideas that you can come up with. 
Yeah, and also I think that fields aren't like subjects aren't as distinct as we we like to think that they are. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're working in an industry, there's a good chance that your work will impact other industries and it's I think the more that we know about different areas, the more um, I don't know, the more kind of comprehensive solutions we can come up with, the more um, compassionate solutions we can come up with if we're not just looking at things from this one angle. Mm, mm. And I guess that also speaks volumes of not just being a multi-potentialite, but s working with other uh, people and other multi-potentialites, because then you're just drawing from so many broad and diverse experiences rather than mm -hmm. just working with people who are exactly like you. Yeah, Steve, sorry, do you mind if I just check on my dog? It's strange for her to be barking this much. <laughs> yep, no, that's cool. Go for it. Okay, I'll be right back. Hey, sorry about that. No, that's completely cool. So what's your dog's name? Uh, it's Grendel. Grendel. So I'm going to totally re rename this podcast. Steve interviews Emily and, and Grendel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the other strengths that the book um, touches on were rapid learning and adaptability. And adaptability, I mean, we know today that with uh, – exponentially growing technology. We know that up to 50% of jobs may not exist in say 10 mm -hmm. to 15 years time, a lot of automation going on. And kids today need to be more adaptable than ever. It's not enough for them to just learn to become a lawyer and expect that they can do that for the next 20 or 30 years of their lives. So how important is it um, to, yeah. to adaptability being a multi-potentialite? Yeah, it's it's hugely important. I mean, adaptability is, like you said, maybe even more of a necessity than anything. I think it's something that multi-potentialites do quite well because you know, we like taking on new things and morphing into new identities. And um, but but yeah, because of the economy and the way that technology is developing, uh, it's not you know you, you can't really say like learn these five skills these you know these are the skills that will be important we just don't know mm -hmm. so the best thing you can do is develop the ability to be comfortable jumping around and you know trying new things and um and and i think that having the ability to be adaptable means that um, whatever kind of work opportunity comes up you can kind of you have the confidence to kind of be like okay i'm i'm gonna try that out i've got I've got similar skills or, you know, I've just tried that once before. And, um, so I think it's a huge asset. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, what you just said there reminds me of, uh, what Tony, Rob Tony Robbins talks about when he says, um, he talks about different ways you can grow belief, um, being things like knowledge, past experiences, uh, visualization and events. So events and past experiences. So if you get comfortable learning lots of different things, doing lots of different things. When, when an opportunity comes up, you're like, oh, yeah, I've done that before. This is something mm -hmm. new, but I've conquered new things before. So you're just more open to them and just embracing such opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I mean, on your TED Talk, I mentioned it earlier, and congratulations, you've got something like 3.7 million views, which is Thanks. awesome. Um, you talk about the, the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? And I absolutely love... Well, I don't love the question, but I love that you talk about this. And I mean, we run a kids entrepreneurship program um, where we ask the kids, the first thing we ask them when they come in is, what problem do you want to solve? Not what do you want to be when you grow up? Because that completely changes the game. But why is this such a dangerous question to be asking kids? Yeah, the problem with this question is, is really what it implies. Because you know, when, when someone asks you this question, they're really expecting one answer. Mm -hmm. And if you're a little kid and you answer five different things, like that's not such a big deal. They'll, you know, the adults will kind of like chuckle and be like, oh, yeah. that's so cute. Uh, but as you get older and this, you know, this question takes various forms, you know, like what, what are you going to major in in college? What career are you going to pursue? Whatever form this question takes, you, it becomes less acceptable to drop, you know, like five different uh -huh. answers. Um, and so we start to learn like, okay, like I need to pick something. I need to pick one thing and I can't be everything. Um, and, um, yeah, so, you know, it's just, it, it's kind of, it's a problematic question because it, 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 that along with other things like the, you know, phrases like phrases like Jack of all trades, master of none. And, mm -hmm. um, the idea, like it's, it's really bad to be a quitter. Like these are the kind of these, these subconscious messages that we get throughout our lives um, that 
make us feel like we have to pick one thing. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that this idea is actually very historical. It comes, it really comes from the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, or at least that was when it kind of became a big deal, right? Like, because back then every person needed to kind of be a cog in the system and Mm -hmm. that's what led to efficiency. And, you know, that model was brought to our school systems and, um, but we don't think about it that way. We just think, oh, that's just like how it is. You know, that's, we all have to just pick one thing that's just natural, but actually it's really very, uh, very much kind of a, a social construct. Yeah, and I, and I think as we move out of the industrial revolution and into, well, not the the industrial age, into the information age, um, what companies are now looking for, at least the more progressive companies, is T-shaped mm-hmm. individuals um, who, I guess, fall into the definition of jack of all trades. I mean, they might be really good at one thing, but they can work across a range of different mm-hmm. disciplines. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I would say that... Um, you know, with, with, like you mentioned earlier, with things like automation and um, jobs going abroad, it's becoming a lot of jobs, a lot of kind of specialized jobs can be replaced. Mm. Um, and if you are kind of this unique person who has several skills and you can do a bunch of different things, that makes you harder, you know, it makes you kind of indispensable. Mm. And, and I guess it's not only, you know, little kids, but, you know, as you become a, a young adult or, say, a, mm-hmm. an old teenager, say, 17 years old, you're, you're often asked to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life, right? And right. you go right. off to university, say, you want to study accounting, and then you do this three or four year degree, you go off and work for some big accounting firm for three or four years, you become part of this sort of um, eco chamber and surrounded by people just Mm -hmm. like you, you start playing the game and at that point you've invested so many years, potentially money for your your studies and and so on Mm -hmm. and stopping to go on and do something completely different becomes this big sort of Mm -hmm. mountain to climb. It's just, I can't do that. I've done all this work. I can't do something else that I may enjoy way more because I've already invested so much time and money. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I hear from people who are like in midlife who Mm. tell me like I tried so hard to kind of stick with that thing and to fit into this specialist mold. And like, I just, was miserable. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but yeah, there's this feeling that you've invested so much time and sometimes money. Um, but I think people need to realize that a lot of skills are transferable across mm-hmm. disciplines and, and, you know, you bring everything that you learn into every new thing that you do. Um, I don't know if that's comforting or not, but, but <laughs> it helps me when I'm kind of like starting to lose interest in something and I become interested in something else. And like, okay, that wasn't, that wasn't a waste. Like I'm taking all of those experiences and all of those skills with me to this new area. And there have been several occasions when I've integrated outside skills into my work. And um, mm. yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I was going to touch on, on that. I mean, I mentioned earlier the different sort of path you've taken, a lot of um, hop, skip, and jumping from completely different areas. And I mean, mm-hmm. I, how like, okay, I'm going to ask you an interesting question. How have you managed, not to say that the other questions aren't interesting, of course, but <laughs> how have you managed to say, take what you learned playing in a punk band um, yeah. into what you do today? Yeah, so playing in a band taught me a lot about working with a team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I do that in my business. I have, you know, I've got a little team that I work with. Um, It also taught me about, you know, creating events because I booked a lot of shows for the band Mm -hmm. and put, you know, put those kinds of things together. Um, And, you know, last year I ran a putty retreat, which was a little retreat of about 10 multi-potentialites. And I don't know if I can, you know, exactly trace like, oh, I learned this skill, (laughs) you know, but but a lot of those skills, I think I, I got my first experience putting together events in, in that realm. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can think of anything else. Well, I recorded, I recorded a lot of music back then. And, um, so occasionally I'll, you know, make videos or do something like that video or audio. And sometimes that knowledge comes in. Um, I did, I actually had a podcast briefly, uh, like five years ago and mm-hmm. I totally used my audio editing knowledge to kind of, cut things together and 
you know. So, so yeah, there are a few ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, as you were saying that and talking about how you, um, you know, had to put on shows. I mean, mm-hmm. I think about my time as a, a heavy metal nightclub promoter, and you know, we would have nights where we'd have maybe ten to fifteen people turn up. They were, it would absolutely bomb, and I guess. Through that experience, I learned about the power of influencer marketing, which we do online now. And we would partner with promoters, and then we'd say, "Hey, we'll do the, we'll run the after party as long as the band comes down. We'll provide drinks." And so once you promoted the fact that, "Hey, this band is going to be at this club afterwards," suddenly we'd have 200 people there, and it was all because of the power of that brand name, just leveraging the strength of someone yeah. else's audience. And it was just, it was a hit. And now doing that online where you can tap into audiences of hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, like we're doing on the podcast, we've had some guests with half a million um, Twitter followers and they share a podcast and suddenly your listens for the month go up 50%. So there are so many transferable skills, I mm-hmm. think. And the more you do, like going back to what we were talking about at the start of the show, the more opportunities you'll see. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I just thought of another one, which might actually be the biggest one. Mm -hmm. um, And that's performance. I mean, getting up on stage, I definitely think playing music live helps me with public speaking later on. And it's just kind of getting comfortable, getting comfortable on stage. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, do you have any rituals you partake in before you get up on stage (laughs) or like visualization or... Yeah, I do a little bit of that stuff. I like the power pose. Uh huh. You know, I like I like the power pose. Yeah, um, yeah. What's what? Have you got a particular power pose? <laughs> I usually do like the Wonder Woman stance. Uh, you know, awesome. <laughs> it's, it's a good. One. That's like the hands on the <laughs> hips with your head to tilted yeah, to the side. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Yep. <laughs> um, and you you have to time it because if you just like leave yourself to your your own devices, you'll you'll get bored after like a minute. But if mm-hmm. you time it and you go for like a full three minutes, mm-hmm. then towards the end of those three minutes, you start to feel really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, <laughs> um, yeah. Anything else you do? Or? Um, I mean, well, before my TED talk, I did a bunch of things. I like went outside and meditated. I I was going on second to last. It was like 6 p.m. So I had a whole day of being anxious. So I take breaks and go outside and walk around and yeah, nothing, nothing specific, but like a lot of kind of, you know, mindfulness stuff. Yeah. And, um, yeah, meditation before performance is definitely a big one for me. And I, I think there was this pivotal uh, moment in your TED talk where you basically, I think you said something al- along the lines of, you know, you don't have to feel bad for being a multi-potentialer and then everyone clapped and then your energy, you can tell you just boom, you're like, okay, I've got them in, in the palm of my hand now. <laughs> yeah, I was not expecting that. I was, really wasn't expecting the applause there. I had no idea that was coming. So yeah. that was really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that, that was really cool to watch as well. Um, so I guess if I'm a multi-potentialite listening to this, thinking this all sounds well and good, but how do I make a living exploring my many skills and interests? Yes. So that is why I wrote this book. Um, I felt like there was, there are, you know, there are a couple books out about this topic and people might not use the word multi-potentialite. They might say generalist or scanner or polymath, but um, I couldn't find any resources that really help with the financial side of things, really help with the work side of things. So what I decided to do was I put out a call to my audience. Um, I ended up interviewing about 50 people, uh, 50 multi-potentialites who kind of self-described as being both happy and financially comfortable. And then I sent out a few surveys um, to a couple thousand more people in my audience. And um, I just really wanted to understand how multi-potentialites make a living. Mm-hmm. And what I found is that you know there aren't really people had all sorts of careers you know I can't say like go be an entrepreneur or um, go be an architect or be a, a, a project manager because that's a great job for <laughs> potentially uh, which was quite frustrating um, because it made it hard to teach this stuff but I found some similarities um, pretty much everyone had three things in common they had created lives and careers that provided them with sufficient money, meaning, and variety. Those seem to be the three common elements that I saw. Um, When it comes to money, obviously, like you need to define what enough is for you. That's different from person to person. Um, With meaning, you know, we don't want, 
what you don't want is a career where you you're doing a bunch of different things, you're making money, but you don't care about any of the things that you're doing. You know, yeah. so you, you just like want to sense that you're making a difference, that you're doing something important. Um, and again, that's that means something different to everyone. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to variety, that's one that you know maybe it's important for everyone, but I think for multi potential, it's 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 really a, a requirement. And um, Again, you need to find that right amount. So if you don't have enough variety in your life, you're going to feel um, bored. You'll feel maybe like you're not getting to express the the breadth of who you are, like you're not fulfilling your potentials. Uh, if you have too much variety, on the other hand, you might feel overwhelmed and scattered and like you're not making enough progress on your various projects and passions. Yeah. Um, so it's about kind of figuring out that right amount. And um, the way that you get the, the money, meaning, and variety, um, there, are, there are a few different ways to do that. So what I did was I, I broke things up into these four, what I saw as the, kind of the commonly used work models. Mm-hmm. Um, so first you've got, and, and by the way, you can, you can be a hybrid. You can kind of like pick and choose and move between these. And I, I always like to say that because uh, I never like to tell my multi-potentialite uh, audience that they need to choose one yeah. thing even if I give them four options. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so you can totally be a hybrid. But um, So the first commonly used work model is what I call the, the group hug approach. It's kind of like if you imagine all of your interests coming together in a big group hug. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that's like one job or business where you get to do a lot of different things, uh, wear many hats, um, often what this looks like is working in an interdisciplinary field, um, something like, you know, design or AI or urban planning. There are a lot of fields where to work in the industry, you need to have an understanding of multiple areas. You need to kind of have uh, a variety of skills. Yeah. Um, it might also involve owning a business because like we mentioned earlier, oh, yeah. there are so many different things that go into that. Um, especially at the beginning when you don't have the funds necessarily to yeah. hire people, you kind of do wear all those different hats. Definitely. Um, I think, um, any f- early stage entrepreneur, maybe you've got a team of two or three people and you're doing design, development, marketing, yep. uh, legal, accounting, sales, absolutely everything. So yeah, totally with you on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so so we've got the group hug approach. The second commonly used work model is what I call the slash approach. Mm-hmm. And this is where instead of combining your interests, you are keeping them separate and you've got a few distinct revenue streams. Um, and these can be jobs, part-time jobs or businesses. Um, but, but yeah, it's basically having multiple part-time work projects. Right. Um, so uh, it's called the slash approach because this will be someone who's like – you know, like um, a teacher slash programmer slash stand yeah. comedian, right? Yeah, you see a few um, of those uh, LinkedIn um, profile uh, titles where you see that slash, slash, slash. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. And people, I mean, that's a whole other topic, but people really struggle with, you know, trying to present what they do to the world when what they do is many things. And I think LinkedIn in particular really frustrates a lot of multi potentialites. Oh, yeah. yeah, it gives you about a um, uh, hundred characters to kind of summarize what you do, but and it only gives you one option, right? It's like uh, this is this is your title. Well I kinda right. I kinda I kinda host a podcast and run this business and run this other business and I write this book every now and again. I write a book every now and again. I write these blogs and it's like mm, what do I say? <laughs> but yeah, yeah exactly. to- totally right. Very <laughs> very frustrating. We'll have to write a letter to LinkedIn. <laughs> Yeah, um, or or get them to like add multi potentialites there. Yes, yes, that would just solve yeah. all of our problems. <laughs> um, so so the third commonly used work model that I that I saw was uh, what I call the Einstein approach, mm-hmm. and that's because Albert Einstein worked in the patent office. Um, he was basically employed by the government for many years, and he developed his theories on the side. So. What this is, is you've got a job or maybe even a a narrow lucrative business that uh, pays the bills, kind of takes care of your financial needs, and then you explore on the side. And, and, you know, the key with with Einstein's job and with this kind of work is that your day job, it it should be enjoyable. It doesn't need to be everything, but you shouldn't hate it. And most importantly, it should leave you with enough free time and energy to pursue your many passions on the side. So. You know, this approach 
um, doesn't work for some people. Um, but for the people who do it and for, for whom it works, um, they tell me that it really takes the pressure off of, you know, they don't worry about monetizing every little thing that they become interested in mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't need to do that. They've got their, their, you know, their source of, of, of income. Yeah. Um, so I, I interviewed one guy named Charlie Harper, who is a, an IT director by day, and then he leaves the office and he goes to musical theater practice, mm. and he sings in an acapella group, and he builds boats on the weekends. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's a really, um, I guess it's a somewhat com common approach, um, where we see a lot of people have full-time gigs, and then they have what we call side hustles. Um, and I think, you know, like you said, uh, the, the full-time gig will provide income so it kind of takes the pressure off but the side hustle will provide some degree of fulfillment or reward um, that takes the pressure off um, the full-time gig and actually makes the full-time gig more enjoyable because it's like well I've got my p passions on the side and I enjoy doing that and that um, gives me this energy that it makes you more content and perform better uh, in mm -hmm. your full-time gig as well. Yeah, very true, very true. And that just goes to show, like, when it comes to the, the three things, money, meaning, and variety, you don't need to get them all in, in one thing or, like, mm. necessarily even all in your career. Uh, as long as overall in your life you, you have that, you know, you have that sense of meaning and you have enough money. And, um, yeah, and, and so the fourth commonly mm -hmm. used work model is what I call the Phoenix approach. And this is like, if you think of a Phoenix who at the end of their life, they kind of burst into flames mm -hmm. and then they're reborn from the ashes. So this is someone who likes to go deep into a field and kind of build a career in an industry. And then after several years, they kind of reach this point where they're like, okay, I kind of, I kind of got what I'm I need done. to get out of this yeah. and I'm ready for a change. And then they start a new career in a totally different field. Um, and that approach really works well for some people. Yeah, and I think that's something you talk about in your TED Talk as well, where you kind of have gone through a lot of change, where you get really into something, and then after a while, like, eh, I'm kind of bored, I'm going to go do something else. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely yeah. nothing wrong with that, because you're just um, growing or just expanding your experience of life. Right. You just, you know, um, Barbara Sher is an author who has written about this as well, and she says that we kind of – lose interest in something once we have gotten what we came for. Mm. And that often isn't a degree or a particular standing in, in our industry or whatever. It's, it's often not an external thing. It's, it's sometimes very personal. Mm. Um, and you kind of, you start to feel a little bit bored and you start to feel like I need a, I need a new challenge. Like I kind of, I kind of got this. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's not for everyone because a lot of people, I suppose, um, have a fear of perhaps not being the best at something. Maybe right. they, they've become comfortable being the best in their field and then it's like, well, I'm going to go off and do something else where I'm starting from the bottom. And it can be a massive hit to, to the ego in many cases so people don't even uh, attempt it. Yeah, and I think that if that is something that's important to you, then it, you might do well with the first work model, with the, the group hug approach, mm. where you pick an, uh, an interdisciplinary field where you get to do a lot of different things and you just kind of work your way up in that area, um, but you're still getting the variety because there's so much involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love that that approach. Um, and uh, what if, uh, I mean, do you have any advice in the book for people who, say, are juggling multiple projects? Yes. Um, so there's a whole chapter on, on productivity, mm -hmm. um, specifically with the multi-potential in mind. So there, you know, there's a lot of productivity advice out there and often it's like focus, you know, fo just like <laughs> pick something and just do that thing and get rid of all distractions. And, um, that's not particularly helpful for us because, um, I think like you said, we really, um, kind of get our creativity and our spark from exploring other things. Mm. And we often integrate those other things into our primary work. And um, so d it definitely I spend a lot of time talking about how to focus on many projects and also make progress on them. Um, so my kind of main tip when people ask me, like, how do I do all the things is um, – you kind of, you pick a few priority projects, right? You pick like maybe one to four priority projects, right? Mm -hmm. For right now. And 
when it's time to, when it's work time you take a look at what those projects are you can like hang them on the wall if you like and you pick one and you work on it and then when you kind of start to lose steam you can take a break and go back to it or you can switch to another priority project and then later on in the day if you're feeling like you really want to explore something else you're, you've got like shiny object syndrome there's something else that has piqued your curiosity that you want to research then you can take what I call tinkering time mm -hmm. tinkering and that's time kind of yeah tinkering Tinkering time, um, and that's kind of like you give your permission, you give yourself permission to just go down the rabbit hole and to just multitask if you want. Like set set a timer for I, I like forty minutes, but you know you could pick an amount that's right for you, just so you know it's not going to take over your whole day. Mm -hmm. And have some fun and let yourself explore. And then when you return to your one or two or three priority projects, um, you're going to feel that much more refreshed, and yeah. maybe you'll have some new ideas. Yeah, and I actually, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, observation because a lot of people, you know, a lot of conventional wisdom in, in the mm -hmm. entrepreneurial space, the marketing space, like you said, it's focus on the one thing, focus on the one metric that matters, um, just do that, get that right because if you try and be everything, if you try and do a lot right. of different things, you, you'll suck at all of them. But, right. <laughs> but for a multi-potentialite, if you – are doing say two, three, four projects because you're getting that variety. You know, one of the three areas you talked about earlier, money, meaning variety. It means that the energy you bring to those three or four projects is going to be very high, rather than having say working at twenty percent of your of your max, just focusing on the one thing and just not being able to grind it out. Right, that's a really good point. I mean, and and it's it's like I. I can't spend all day writing. Like mm. if I write for a couple hours and then I switch and I do some design work like that, that then I'm like fresh, you know, then I can do a really good job at the design stuff and, and then I can go back to the writing or I can go to something else. But, um, yeah, I think it, it it's, it's important. Um, mm. and you're right. There is this, this idea that, um, you're either, you either do one thing and you're amazing at it or you you do like everything and you're kind of crappy at everything. And really there's, there's actually like quite a vast middle ground where mm. you can do several things and be quite good at several things like that. That is possible. <laughs> and lots of people that I would, maybe that's even how most people are. But, um, yeah, I think that this dichotomy of like the, you know, um, you're either like a master or you're like some kind of dilettante is, is really false <laughs> and problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more on that. Um, so, uh, I mean, one thing that kind of, uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, it kind of frustrates me or it just takes me back sometimes is when I hear adults who, you know, they could be in their twenties or thirties or even forties and, you know, they might say something like, Oh, you know, you're, you're doing what you love, which is great. And I'm like, well, you can do it too. Mm -hmm. You know, what What are your passions? And like, oh, I don't really have any. And it breaks my heart whenever I hear mm -hmm. someone who's, you know, been on this earth for 30 plus years and they've not explored enough perhaps to identify what their passions are. Like, I mean, what what do you say in those situations? Yeah, I, I actually have, I have a hard time understanding situations like that. I mean, mm. I, like most of the people who come to me are, like super passionate yeah. about so many things and they're just having a hard time figuring out what to do with that and how to make it work for them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that you know, it's kind of like creativity. People have this idea like I, I'm just not a creative person yeah. and I actually feel like everyone is a creative person and maybe you're just unpracticed. So maybe it's just a matter of kind of letting yourself explore a little, letting yourself be curious and you know, letting yourself quote waste time. Because there's such a push in our culture to just be productive all the time, and if, and you know you don't want to do something if there's no point to it. But actually, I think that we would benefit a lot from doing pointless activities just because we're curious, just because we want to kind of see what we can learn. Um, and and I feel like kids do this a lot, and it's stamped out of us at some point um, for for some of us. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess um, it just comes back to you know not falling into the trap of just doing things that align with that chosen mm-hmm. career, regardless of whether or not it's fulfilling. Like you know, say, like going back to that whole story of getting an accounting degree and working in that field, and then just doing things that one would expect an accountant to do, um, right. rather than going off and explore different things. And I mean, one way that I personally try to um, keep that curiosity at, at a high is just to do one thing every month that's completely new, and often something that completely scares the, the hell out mm-hmm. of me. Like, like this Easter Monday morning, I'm going skydiving and I'm absolutely, oh, wow. I'll say, it, shitting bricks. And it's something that I am definitely having to uh, visualize every morning. Just spend five minutes kind of visualizing the lead up to it, the jump, everything. Just so when it happens, when Monday morning comes around, I'll be ready. But it's just that sort of intentional approach saying, hey, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to just map out a bunch of things that I can do this year that are new, that are exciting, that are scary. So I do have that you know, regain that childlike sort of curiosity about the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of the times when people um, aren't sure what they're passionate about, maybe they haven't been spending time with other people who are, who are like this, who are, um, you know, exploring their interests and pursuing personal goals and projects. And often it's about kind of getting around the right people and Mm. that can really inspire you. Yeah, definitely. You know, you are who you are because of what you put into your mind and, what is, I'm just going to throw two uh, platitudes into one, and you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with, right? So there you go. It's so true. Um, so tell me about the um, work you're doing with Putty Like. Yeah, so Putty Like is kind of how this whole thing started. Um, I decided in, in my mid twenties that I was going to stop fighting this thing about myself that mm-hmm. you know I, I have a lot of different interests. I'm going to find a way to make it work. And I started blogging about it and I started learning from other people who do many different things. And um, it has evolved since then. Um, And, you know, now it's, it's still a blog, but there's also, there's, you know, there's like a, we've got an online course and the community and um, a lot of, a lot of different things going on. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a home for multi-potentialites. So um, we write about the things that, multi-potentialites deal with and some of our challenges, stuff like work, career productivity, um, kind of fear and, and these sort of emotional aspects of that, explaining what you do to friends and family members and um, a lot of different topics, mm-hmm. all of which matter to, to multi-potentialites. Definitely. And, and I think that's an important point you touched on as well, like explaining what you do to friends, family, society, and so on, who may have um, ex- expectation of you um, and you know, leaving, say, a well-paying sort of career to embark upon something that may not pay you anything in the, in the short term um, can often be frowned upon and, and may raise eyebrows. And I mean, how does one navigate those conversations, be it with their spouse, uh, partner, parent, and so on? Yeah, I think that if you can help people understand what it means to be a multi-potentialite, mm. that that's the best thing to try first. Yeah. Um, so, so kind of explaining it, if they understand that this is who you are and that there are other people out there like this and other people out there who are successful doing many different things or kind of moving around a little bit, um, that will help. Mm. Um it also depends on who you're speaking to. Sometimes it's just like not worth it, but if it's someone close to you, um, then it's worth trying to explain. And I, I speak to a lot of, uh, actually like everyone that I interviewed for the book, I made sure to ask them if they had support from their family when they were younger and they were kind of like jumping around. And um, the ones who said no, almost all of them said that as they got older and as the people in in their lives saw them um, kind of making it work and saw that they were happy and they were, you know, paying the bills, people kind of backed off a little bit and they're kind of like, okay, well, I don't really get it, but they seem happy. They're doing well. So, um, so people often will come around once you're already doing it. It's just that they, they, they like to try and wait. There's a saying about that too, right? It's easier to ask for forgiveness than yeah. permission. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so a little bit of that applies here. Um, but then ultimately like, you know, you need to, you got to do your thing, right? Like, um, obviously take care of your responsibilities, but, um, if you're going to stay stuck in a role that, that doesn't serve you, that isn't working for you just to please other people, like you're going to end up being 
pretty miserable. Yeah. So definitely, and um, you mentioned that people tend to be happier once they make that change, and uh, you know that's a story I've heard many times from people who perhaps were working in a particular c- corporate role um, weren't overly. Uh, happy with what they were doing, weren't very fulfilled and went off to work, say, for a startup or do their own thing or just go off and explore some passion project and do it for way less money. But then their uh, partners will be like, wow, they're so much happier and, and so much better mm-hmm. to be around. Um, and yeah, I mean, it speaks volumes rather than just saying, hey, I want to go off and do all these crazy things. Once they actually see it, you know, show, don't mm-hmm. tell, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, definitely back off at that point. Yeah, for sure. Mm, awesome. Well, Emily, you've been an awesome guest, and so has your, your dog. Uh, was it Gretel? Uh, Grendel. Grendel, sorry, Grendel. Grendel has been awesome. But before we go, I've got to throw you into our lightning round. So let's see how uh-huh. a multi potential that goes in our three question lightning round. Are you ready to rock and roll? Yeah, sure. I hate these. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the first question is kind of redundant for a multi potential light like you, but I'm going to give it a shot, anyways. It is, if you could work for any company, at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? I don't know. I really like being self-employed. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, yep, no, look, totally, totally get that. Um, I didn't <laughs> expect anything less from you. Um, qu- qu- question number two, hopefully you'll do better. Well, not necessarily better, but hopefully you'll be able to answer this one, which is, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Jeez, I don't. You know, this is going to be a really weird answer, actually. Mm-hmm. That's but, cool. I like weird. Uh, yeah, so so you mentioned earlier in our conversation that television writing was an interest of mine. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by kind of, strangely enough, like well-written teen dramas. Teen dramas? Uh, okay. Teen dramas. Wow. Yeah, like, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Yeah, like especially shows of the '90s and early 2000s, like like My So-Called Life uh-huh. um, and Freaks and Geeks and things like that. Oh, I loved Freaks and Geeks. <laughs> it's a great show. Yeah, I mean, it's so well written. But I think like growing up, I just I I felt very misunderstood in my life, and um, shows like that made me feel like someone understood me and just it meant a lot to me. And mm. um, that's part of why I enjoy writing that kind of thing too. Um, so I might ask, I might actually ask Winnie Holzman, the creator of my so-called life, a question. I'm not really sure what that question would be. I would actually just like to hang out with her and, and have a conversation. Mm. I don't know if there's something specific. Um, I guess maybe I would ask her like, you know, how much of the show is autobiographical um, mm. and just talk a little bit about the relationship between kind of real life and, and fiction and because um, just the, the emotions are, are so real and just felt so universal or at least felt really true to me and she captured that really well. But I don't know. This is just like a, a little nerdy thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's cool. I, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, entrepreneurs usually they're solving a problem that they've personally experienced and I guess with writing you know perhaps there is a degree of experiential um, writing particularly a teen drama I mean what a teen TV show like going through what you went through as a, as a teenager you know looking for identity being confused not mm-hmm. fitting in all that sort of stuff can really uh, manifest itself in a in a TV show like Freaks and Geeks. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Ah, oh, Freaks and Geeks is so good. So good. I used to, I used to like just geek out on a lot of anything seventies rock sort of inspired. Like one of my favorite films growing up, I think I was about twelve when I first saw it when it came out at the cinemas. Was Detroit Rock City because I was a big Kiss fan at mm-hmm. the time with hair down to my butt. So I just remember watching these kids who are like fifteen getting drunk and partying and be like, "Yeah, I want to be like them." So, anyways, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, spoke. it's amazing like how nerdy you get about stuff like this when you're a teenager. Like how important music is. Oh yeah. And yeah. There's something about it that I, I find really um, inspiring. I don't mm. know. <laughs> I wonder if it's – I mean I'm showing my age now because I'm 33. But I wonder if it's the same for teenagers today because obviously um, you know, going back 10, 15 years, music and the type of music you listen to was such a big part of your identity. It was mm. a big part of how you express yourself. But today in, in, in the wired age, I mean it seems like kids are listening to all kinds of music that they're not necessarily aligned to. Hey, I'm a, I'm a hip-hop guy. Or I'm a punk guy. I'm the metal guy. People kind of listen to everything. And because they're online so much, it doesn't seem like it's a, as big a part of their identity anymore. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I I bet that music is still really important to teenagers. Mm. Um, maybe maybe they they don't kind of identify as one with by using one particular genre. Yeah. Um, but. I, I bet that music is still pretty important. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, okay, and the lucky last question, Emily, is on the rituals and routines that help you stay on top of your game. We've, we've touched on a few. I know you meditate. I know you power pose like Wonder Woman and um, do a bit of visualization. So, I mean, do, is there anything else you do to just kick goals in life? Um, yeah, I mean, I think lately I've been getting really into hiking and mm -hmm. I there's – a high, there's a trailhead like basically across the street from where I'm living right now and um, so Grendel and I will go for our usual hike every day um, sometimes I'll do it before I work other times I'll do it for a break um, but yeah it's really important for me to get outside I've realized um, and to kind of you know be out in nature be out in the world awesome because <laughs> I could definitely I mean I'm such an introvert and I work online so I could easily just hang out in my little office layer and like have lots of fun but like ultimately it's it's not very good for me so yeah yeah uh, that, that's cool and it's quite easy to to get outside when you live on an island yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's very beautiful here yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome awesome um Awesome, Emily. So the book comes out May the 2nd. It'll be available um, Amazon, iTunes, uh, Google Play, Barnes & Noble, um, any other physical bookstores that are left. I'm sure it will be there as well. So the <laughs> book's called How to Be Everything. So I'll include that in the show notes for our listeners. Um, but if people want to find out a bit more about you, about Putty Like, they can head over to puttylike.com. They can find you on Twitter at Emily, is it Wapnik? Is that the right pronunciation? Yeah, Emily Wapnick. Emily Wapnick. Um, we'll share that in the show notes as well. Is there anywhere else people should go to find out something about yourself and connect? Or um, Putty Like is probably the best place. You can also learn more about the book specifically at howtobeeverything.com. Excellent. I'll um, include that in the show notes. So, look, thanks again for your time today. Emily, do you have any departing words of wisdom for the multi-potentialized listening? <laughs> yeah, I would just say that you know, if this has if this idea resonates with you and you feel like you might be a multi-potentialite, which you know, I actually never, I don't think I ever defined. Um, so it's someone, <laughs> someone with many interests and creative pursuits. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, then you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the rest of us to embrace your many passions and to, um, to pursue multiple things and to kind of see where this leads. Because I really feel like multi-potentialites, um, are are innovators and um we do such interesting work and it's really a shame if you stifle that mm -hmm. yeah could not agree more that's beautiful thank you so much emily for your time i hope you, you and grendel enjoy the rest of your day <laughs> great thanks so much for having me cheers Hey guys, it's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, um, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Glaveski. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.